<clears throat> Good day and welcome to SEO Bricks Insight, where we look at what's really going on in the world of the BRICS. Now, the volume of trade between Russia and the European Union has decreased by a third in the first five months of this year, compared to the same period in 2023. It's down to only 28 billion. At the same time, it's worth noting that trade with European countries will not entirely be halted. This is mainly because the EU is dependent on Russia for energy resources and fertilizers. Also, Moscow continues to buy some of the selected European goods, which are uh, certain countries are continuing uh, to collaborate with Russia. And you know, what is the scale of these partnerships, and uh, what are their strategies for entering the new markets? You know, the EU sanctions against Russia have had a negative impact, obviously, on the trade with uh, Russia. Now, over the past ten years, the, the decline has been absolutely enormous. I mean, it used to be in the hundreds of billions, and it's now, by 2023, had dropped to 89.4 billion. Now, according to the Russian permanent mission to the EU, yeah, it still has one, it anticipates that the current negative trend is going to continue and will continue. Now, who are the largest importers of Russian products in the EU? Well, in 2023, the Netherlands, with 6.3 billion, was actually 12% of what the EU total imports from Russia. Hungary at 5.8 billion, Italy at 4.1, Belgium at 3.8, and Slovakia at 3.8 billion too. So, I mean, it's quite significant. On the export side, Germany was the largest. They accounted for 25% of the EU's total exports to Russia, which was a value of 8.9 billion. Netherlands and um, Belgium and Poland, they're all around 3 to 4 billion. So, you know, and what's kind of surprised was Poland because it's one of the major uh, anti Russian countries. It still did 2 billion worth of business. Now, according to Polish companies, they're actually not uh, directly doing it, but they're circumventing the sanctions through third party countries, particularly the even more Russophobic Baltics. Now, Italian exports to, to Russia are primarily textiles and clothing, uh, all sorts of wine and metallurgical and a few chemical products. I mean, the Russian embassy in Rome has uh, identified uh, metallurgical products, minerals, agricultural products, coke, petroleum products, plus food and beverages are the key exports from Russia to Italy, and that includes wheat for Durham, uh, wheat for pasta. So it's worth noting that the, despite the negative trends, there are some positive growth in certain indicators. I mean, exports from uh, to Russia from Portugal, for example, uh, increased by compared to before, and it was mainly agriculture and food products, uh, specialist type of food products. But you know, Lisbon actually sold over 50 million euros worth of sales to Russia. Now, before I continue, I'd like to make an appeal. If you like and enjoy my videos and you want to help me fund and develop the channel, uh, plus my website, so it brings insight, you can do this by making a small donation, which is done by clicking on the thanks button at the bottom of the video screen. Everybody who donates does get a personal thank you from me. And I thank all of you who've already donated. Uh, it's been greatly appreciated and I do think of all of you and I thank you all. The European countries continue to buy mainly energy resources, with oil being the significant part of this. I mean, one of the few remaining supply channels is the southern branch of the Druzba, ironically called Friendship Oil Pipeline, which delivers uh, oil to Hungary, Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Now, following the decision by the Ukraine to block the transit of Luke Oil's uh, products through its territory in July, Budapest and Bratislava are not happy and they're calling that there's going to be a major energy crisis resulting from this. I mean also EU members still import gas with LNG playing an increasingly prominent role in the last year or so. I mean when you take LNG into account, Russia's share of gas imports is about 15% of the total that uh, the uh, EU has and it's the second largest supplier uh, to Europe with uh, the US being in the first place. I mean, it's obvious that Russia-European trade will never be down to zero because it's just not infeasible to envisage a, a situation where uh, Russia and the, the EU stop doing stuff with each other. I mean, for example, they're never going to do without the Russian fertilizers. Russia's one of the largest exporters of fertilizers, and that's why they've never been sanctioned. So, 
that oil, gas, and uh, fertilizer, they're just going to have to keep doing that. And that's why European Union still buys twice as much fertilizer from Russia as it did in 2022. That's mainly because its own fertilizer producers can't compete with the Russians because of the high price of gas for producing fertilizers. I mean, that's why you know, Russia's exports have reached a, a high uh, with the nitrogen fertilizers accounting for about 40% of the total volume that the EU uses. I mean, at the same time, uh, the EU restrictions have had a major impact on the EU themselves. I mean, you know, the, their farmers are up in arms because they're, um, they can't afford the fertiliser that the local uh, producers are, are doing. And, you know, the negative trends uh, Russia experienced in trade turnover with EU member countries only actually harms them. And they have to buy the Russian stuff uh, from elsewhere. And normally it's through Turkey and places like that. So they're buying Russian goods at a much more expensive price. So, I mean, the Western sanctions haven't annoyed the Russian economy. It has shown remarkable resilience and its growth is highest levels in over two decades. I mean, apart from the, obviously the post-COVID period. I mean, Hungary's Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, the own fine terrible of the EU, I mean, he says, you know, Russia's de demonstrated a level of flexibility in economic terms uh, that can only be commended. He says, it's insights from the sanctions imposed in 2014 have given them the necessary experience and flexibility to uh, adapt and, uh, and change. So in the context of Western sanctions, Russia has been able to reinforce its trade and economic relations away from the EU. So we can effectively say it's a, you know, a divorce from the EU and a, a new relationship beginning with Asia. I mean, now, according to Alexei Overchok, who's the Deputy Prime Minister, Russia's economy has already reorientated itself towards the markets of the global South and Asia. I mean, China's Russia's largest trading partner. In 2023, trade turnover with uh, China was huge. It got to uh, 228 billion, and that's a historical record by far that it's ever. I mean, and Russia's actually now in fourth place amongst China's foreign trade partners. Now, India, another BRICS member, is another key trade and economic partner. By the end of 2023, the value of the trade between the countries had got to 65 billion. Now, bear in mind, only three years pre prior to that, it was around 12 to 14 billion. So Russia is now uh, the fourth largest trading partner for India, and that's mainly with oil pr uh, products. And obviously, the, M Modi and Putin uh, have set a goal of reaching 100 billion by 2030. Now that's going to work because Russia is importing a lot of different medical and pharmaceutical products from India, and they're going to invest in Russia. So Russia's made its expanding cooperation with countries in Southeast Asia. I mean, from January to, to November in 2023, uh, Russian trade with the ASEAN, that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, has boomed. Now, they've been buying a fair bit of stuff, and it's mainly foodstuffs, uh, agricultural products, uh, rice, but also pork, for example. I mean, countries like Miramar, which used to be Burma, uh, is now buying a lot of rice and uh, vegetables, while trade with Singapore has gone up by 112%. But we know that is by them buying Russian oil, which they're now selling on to other parties. Places like Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam uh, are showing strong performance. Again, they are buying Russian protein type products, so it's meats, uh, chicken, etc. Also, obviously, wheat products for Vietnam, Myanmar and Indonesia. And <clears throat> now that the trade restrictions have been lifted, they're selling fertilizers to these countries as well. I mean, last year, 75% of Russia's foreign trade was countries which had friendly relations. And it's everybody apart from the EU, the G7 and the US. So in addition to India, China, the European uh, Asian countries, Latin America and the Middle East are now promising partners. I mean, the objective of Russia was reorientating itself away from uh, the EU, and that's been successfully achieved. I mean, it's now selling its primary energy resources, like oil and gas, to India. And of course, they buy it, and then they resell it on. And now it's also reorientated its mineral resource base to friendly countries. 
I mean, its goal now goes to the Middle East, uh, to the United Arab Emirates, and to uh, to China. I mean, one of the problems, though, that uh, Russia is actually getting is the customs, transit, and logistics infrastructure in Asia, which is not as advanced as it was, which the supply chains that Russia had developed with uh, with the EU, but with the North South Transportation Corridor, the Trans Siberian Railway, and the links going through uh, the old the Belt and Road Initiative, this is really now beginning to happen. So that's just one of the minor things that needed to be overcome. But, you know, companies and importers uh, and exporters, they're adapting to the sanctions and using the intricate re-export, -re parallel import, uh, export schemes, using intermediate countries. I mean, Turkey has boomed. It's become a pivotal transport for the continued supply of Russian gas to Europe, for example. And in terms of uh, other goods, Turkey is a major transit point for goods from the EU, uh, disguising the, the where they're actually going and they end up into Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan and then into Russia. I mean, I mean, one of the problems is Russia did have to offer some discounts and mineral products uh, on oil, etc. But it was always making money on them and it didn't really affect the... the I mean, the price of oil is over 85, giving a $10 uh, discount doesn't really matter. You know, they're still making a substantial... Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the most significant things are uh, is as the EU and its trading partners are in recession, uh, as their people are experiencing inflation, its consumers are not buying, the trading relationship now it has with the Eurasian Economic Union, with China, Iran, India, and Russia's expanding, it's also going to expand its trade relations with Africa. I mean, in the next 30 years, the population of Africa is going to double. In the coming years, it's the African countries as well as Southeast Asia that are going to drive the real growth in the world the economy. And that's because there's stagnation in Europe and there's obviously a slowdown in growth in China. So, yeah, over the next two decades, India particularly and Africa will be the primary engines of uh, economic growth. And Russia is in uh, the business now of making sure that its activities are moving towards those markets and it's built a you know a very positive relationship with these countries which is not always a, a straightforward process now russian investors are now looking to invest in these countries particularly like vietnam after putin's uh recent visit i mean uh they're now building uh, an lng plant to go along with the relative with the uh, oil refining and the petrochemical plant and uh, according to Evgeny Kovalev who's a researcher at the Vietnam and Asian studies at the Russian Academy he says Vietnam's now a significant player in the East Asian region I mean it's one of the new power engines and from an economic standpoint it has a very big relationship with the US and China despite the fact that there's their disputes in the China Sea I mean, the Vietnam's trading activity with China stands at 170 billion, while the trading with the US is 110 billion. Now, it's Russia is now getting to the point where it's now around 35 to 40 billion, and that's now only going to improve. I mean, the communications channels and the business uh, circles are still beginning to work. But as the BRICS expands and the number of countries that want to work with the BRICS, these are only going to become easier. And the economic pressure from Washington and its allies, who are trying everything to stop the development of the Russian ferry, are failing miserably. Russia has what people want and they are prepared to buy it. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and do keep the comments coming. I love the comments. I love responding to you and uh, get the feedback, etc. Plus share uh, this video with anybody and do like and don't forget the thanks button. Thank you.